Hi, I'm Heidi Raphael, co-chair for the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation. And I'm Jack Goodman, the other co-chair of the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation. And we would like to welcome you to the LABF Power Session. In this module, you're going to discover the different types of records that the library contains and how you can access them for your projects with the LABF's reference specialist, Michael Henry. Next, learn about sales, how to identify sale leads, and how to close deals from Beasley's Chief Revenue Officer, Tina Murley. Then, hear why creative branding is vital to the success of an audio advertising campaign from Yaman Kaskun, founder of Yaman Air. Finally, get a walkthrough of how to produce a high quality audio commercial with Darren Silva, West Coast Director of Commercial Production for Benstown, and MJ Block, the East Coast Director of Commercial Production. Hello, my name is Michael Henry and I am with the Library of American Broadcasting at the University of Maryland. Last time I spoke to you, I gave you an overview of what the Library of Mar American Broadcasting is. It's an archive devoted to the history of radio and television broadcasting. Now, we cover at the Library of American Broadcasting all aspects of the history of radio and television broadcasting. But today I'd like to give you a, more, a better overview of the kinds of resources we have that document this broadcasting history and American history. So we have a broad array of both print and audio and video resources that researchers have access to in many forms, either remotely or on site here in our reading room at the University of Maryland. We have books, magazines, we have the personal papers of veteran broadcasters, we have photographs, we have audio recordings, and we have film and video recordings. For instance, in our books and pamphlet collections, we have biographies, annual reports, textbooks, program histories, station histories, trade publications that were published to promote and to report on the activities of the broadcast industry. And most of these are cataloged in our online catalog that is accessible from any in, uh, internet browser. We also have magazines. We have radio fan magazines. We have broadcasting trade publications, like Broadcasting Magazine. We have academic magazines and journals, such as the Journal of Broadcasting Electronic Media. And as you see here, we have a cover from a, a 1954 issue of Radio Intelligent Mirror. We also have personal paper collections of men and women who worked in all aspects of broadcasting, as directors, as writers, as executives, as performers. For instance, we have here the, uh, a photograph of a CBS executive by the name of Helen Sousa, who's the director in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s of their talks and public affairs programming at CBS, where she was responsible for a lot of the programming and public addresses on the network. We also have Vox Pop Collection, that document that was an interview show that traveled the country during World War II. We have the papers of the broadcast journalist Howard K. Smith, who was active in the, as a journalist in radio and television from the 1940s through the 1970s. Although we have a great deal of material relating and documenting commercial broadcasting, we also have a great deal of material documenting public and educational broadcasting, such as the papers of the Children's Television Workshop, the organization that created Sesame Street. We also have a huge collection of photographs, stills of broadcasts in action, of headshots, of candid behind-the-scenes production shots, publicity photos that were sent to newspapers and magazines to promote programs. For instance, here's a photograph of Parks Johnson, the host of the Vox Pop radio program, interviewing in 1945 a captain uh, in the Army Air Force. So, um, as, so you can see here, it's very detailed and gives a lot of pr detailed insight into that radio program as it was being aired. So another visual medium that we have are film and video recordings, which take the form of news broadcasts, interviews, conferences. We have the personal papers of Arthur Godfrey, an early radio and television personality, 
So we actually have his kinescope films from the 1950s as an example. And you can actually view these kinescope films on site at the University of Maryland in our digital collections portal. And of course we have audio recordings which are, come in the form of news broadcast, entertainment programs, music programming, industry panels and clinics. We have the uh, audio recordings from the radio news broadcasts of the West Lake House Broadcasting Company, the BMI program clinics of the 1950s. We have Arthur Godfrey's audio recordings as well as his film recordings. So we have a wide variety of, of print and broadcast recordings and audio and video recordings and visual media like photographs and, and artwork that would be of great interest and is of great interest to researchers all over the world who are doing research in the form of, of motion pictures, of academic journals, of histories, even of high school projects as well. So all those resources are available to researchers of all kinds and we are happy to speak with them, uh, to be communicated and, and reached out to. I'm happy to share my email address and other contact information so we can get these resources that I just described to as many hands as we can to fulfill your broadcasting and research needs. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Tina Murley. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Beasley Media Group. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the world of radio sales and marketing. So we'll start with kind of the process of sales and marketing. And I like to start with a quote from Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. This quote could not be more true and evident in sales. It's often people that stop trying and they could have gotten to the opportunity if they had just put one more effort in. So the process of um, marketing sales um, is really you know, summed up on this page right now. The first part, and we'll go over a little bit of this step by step, is prospecting for the right client. Then it's connecting and qualifying with that client, doing your research on that client, pitching them, handling objections, closing the sale, and then what we've heard on many of those sales movies, always be closing the renewal. So we'll always be looking to re-engage with touch points with those clients so that we can be working for the renewal right when, uh, right after we close the deal. So the first step in the sales process is prospecting. And it's important to note that everything is a prospect to an AE who's selling marketing. If you really think about it, every company needs marketing, whether it's small or large. But the key point for an AE in this space or an account executive is that you want to prospect the right client that has a big enough budget that's worth your time, that has a need for your product or service, and that is indeed the person that will be able to give you the yes or no answer. Once we've prospected great clients, we want to qualify them. The, the next process takes um, quite a bit of time because we don't want to spend all of our time and resources building a deck for a lead that is not qualified. So there's two ways that we typically will qualify leads. One is called BANT, and we'll get a little bit more into that. And the other is GPCT. And this will give you a good idea if you follow this process, whether or not, whether or not a prospect is a good fit for the products and services that you're selling. Think of it as an interview. Think of it as you're interviewing the client, trying to get some information to determine if they are a proper prospect um, for your goods or service. So there's two ways that most salespeople do this. They're very similar, so we'll go through them quickly, but the first way that we qualify leads is BANT. We're looking to determine if the client has the proper budget, which is the B, the authority, which do they have the ability to make the decision or do they need to pass the decision over to somebody higher up in their company? Is there a need for your product or service? And then what is the timeline? So through a series of questions that you can ask the prospect, you can determine if it's qualified through this BANT process. So these are some of the questions that you'll look at. You know, it's understanding what their budget is beyond the dollar amount. Who are the stakeholders? Determine how important the problem is to the prospect, which just establishes your timeline. You know, stay informed through multiple channels. You know, you should be following their social media, signing up for their newsletter, attending conferences that they might be part of. And then always use a CRM tool or a customer relationship management tracker so that you can keep um, a ni nice notes of, as to what you found out 
um, throughout this process. Another way that AEs will qualify leads is uh, it's very similar to BANT. It's called GPCT, which is really ascertaining the goals, the plans, the challenges, and the timeline. In the next four slides, we'll go over the types of questions that you can ask to determine the G, the P, the C, and the T. So on this first slide here, we'll talk about goals. Some of the questions you can ask a client are, what are your goals? What are the company's goals? Um, are these something that my product can help them achieve? Does the current plan require a product that you have to offer? Based on your experiences and their situation, is the, time is the timeline reasonable? Once you've determined that there are goals that you can help solve, you want to talk a little bit about what their plans are. Some questions that you can ask to determine what their plans are. What did you do last year? What worked in the past and what didn't work? What do you plan to do differently this year? Do you have the right resources available to implement these plans? These types of questions are really kind of leading into what the timeline is. And it's also leading into what the competitive landscape is, who you're up against when you're, when you're pitching your product or service. Because you'll get a little, you'll get a sense of the history that they've had. Next is their challenges. Um, you want to ask questions, do you think you can eliminate the challenge that they're having? Um, I like to ask, you know, what keeps you up at night? Or if you had a magic wand and I could solve one of your marketing challenges, what would it be? Open-ended questions like that will disarm the client and really allow them to share openly with you as to what their challenges are. And then you can ascertain whether or not what you have in your marketing toolbox can actually meet those challenges and, and solve those needs for them. And then all of these questions, as I said, lead up to timeline. Is this a first quarter initiative, a third quarter initiative? Is it something more long-term that you need to keep in touch with them over the next year because their budget has already been spent? Um, so that some of the questions here are how quickly do you need to achieve these results? When will you begin implementing the plan? Is hitting a goal a priority now? All of these questions, you're just gathering little bits of information so you can put together the best possible pitch for that client in order to win the business. Once you have prospected a client and qualified them as a viable prospect, this third step is what I think is the most important step, and it's probably the step that most account executives don't do well. Um, an anecdotal story that I can tell you about this is we had an opportunity in, in Boston. It was with Hawaiian Airlines. They came into the market. They were coming into the market to launch ser direct service from Boston to Hawaii. So one account executive went in and showed them all the qualitative reasons why their station reached travelers. The A-level AE did a ton of research on what this marketing initiative was. And what it was is they were really touting that they were going to have five direct flights from Boston to Hawaii. Um, the particular client, that particular station that we were working with um, ran the Celtics. We all know in the NBA, there's the starting five. So that very smart A-level AE put together a program that said tonight's starting five lineup for the Boston Celtics is brought to you by Hawaiian Airlines, five nonstop direct flights from Boston to Hawaii. That deal was closed over the one that came with the research that was really talking about their product. So there's many ways to research a client. Um, we use tactics or, or, or services like Winmo, Sponsor United, Miller Kaplan, Media Monitors. These tools really help us determine the budget levels and what the client has done historically and allows us to brainstorm some creative ideas to solve their challenge in a unique way that's, that's custom to that client. Once we've done the research, it's time for the pitch. The presentation step is typically when a salesperson runs a formal product service demonstration for that prospect. You want to make sure you're rehearsing your pitch several times. Make sure it answers the prospect's unique challenge and get creative, be brief, be brilliant, and really be prepared to answer any objections that they have. Which brings us to the next, handling objections. Your sales team or your AE should really be prepared to handle any and all objections in a truthful and transparent way. You want to listen to your prospect's objections and questions and help tailor that to fit their needs. Objections aren't bad. Uh, we like to say that the selling starts when a client says no. If they're asking questions or they're objecting to budget, there's easy ways that you can handle this objection. One particular way in radio that we handle the price or cost objection is something called a benchmark report. 
Oftentimes, if you're selling one of the premier stations in the market, the client will say, you're too expensive. What we do is we'll pull a benchmark report and say, well, it takes 10 stations, 10 commercials per month or per week for you to, to reach 100,000 people. Our competition, you need to buy 50. So are we really more expensive? So it's really just getting those objections out of the way and convincing that prospect that what you're selling will meet their KPIs, give them a great return on investment, um, and really establish value for your marketing program. Closing the deal. Once you've done all of the steps that we just outlined, it's time to close the deal. There are seven closing techniques that any sales rep can use to seal the deal. We'll go through these seven. Um, and before we do so, I will start by saying that when I started my career in sales, I thought of sales as a very, a very negative connotation. I used to think of most salespeople as a used car salesperson. But qu very quickly in my career, I learned that the best salespeople are not salesy. They don't go about it as that approach. It's really a consultative approach that is very research-driven, relationship-driven, and you know, really asking those key questions to get you to a solution that'll help solve a problem. So the seven closing techniques that we'll talk about today is the now or never close. Example of that is this is the last one at this price. This technique usually works because it creates urgency. I will say this was not my particular sales technique. I kind of put this into the used car salesperson. Um, but you can see that it does work for some people. And as we go through these, I would just ask you to you know, think of your own personality, which one is most comfortable for you and that is most authentic to yourself. Because most prospects can tell if you're not authentic or if you're just reading from a script or taking a tactic that you read in a sales book. The next one is summary closes. An example of that is we have a Q1 special on our omni-channel marketing solutions, which include endorsement radio, target display, and social media. What would be the ideal start date for a campaign like this? A little softer than the now or never close. Number three is the sharp angle close. When they ask, could you add on a few, few extra hours of onboarding at a discounted rate, a reply could be, sure, but if I do that for you, will you be able to sign the contract today? Question closes is another popular closing technique. That example would be, in your opinion, does what I'm offering solve your problem? Or is there any reason why we can't proceed with this shipment or this marketing campaign? Again, it, it, it's a little bit of a softer way to close, a little less salesy, and it disarms the prospect. The fifth way is the assumptive close. A great example of an assumptive close is, after a call or meeting, you could ask, did this presentation align with your expectations? Does this sound like something that would be valuable to your company? Does it meet the need or pain point that we discussed when we were doing your customer needs analysis? Takeaway closes, great example of this. We can meet your, if we can meet your suggested pricing and remove the talent endorsement fee, would you be able to move forward? So again, you're taking something away, adding something back in and getting them to commit to what you're looking them to commit to. And finally, the soft close. Example of a soft close is if I could reduce the widget maintenance by 25% and increase productivity by 15%, would you be interested in learning more? You're just trying to get them to the next step of saying yes. And all of these, depending on your personality, can work in, in different ways. So I would say find the one that's most authentic to you and most comfortable to you, and then practice it, hone your technique so it comes across very naturally. Always be closing. So you've done the presentation, you've closed the deal, and a, a poor sales rep just celebrates the sale and moves on. A great sales rep will look for touch points and opportunities to always be closing them for the next time. An example of this is establishing touch points. So you've closed the deal, and now maybe every month you do a recap. This is what we're seeing. This is the deliverables that we've had. How is it working for you? Would you like to change or alter anything? You're really doing mini recaps throughout the campaign, getting ready for them to see the value that you're bringing, see that you're, you are effectively meeting their KPIs so that they will want to renew that campaign. Thank you everyone for your time today. My name is Tina Murley, Chief Revenue Officer for Beasley Media. I'm hoping you learned a little bit more about the sales process and feel a little less intimidated by it. Hi there. You ever heard this commercial? Hi, Tom Bodet. Motel 6 is new improved website lets you book a room and save more for what you travel for faster than that. Of course you have. 
You've heard of Tambo Dutch. Would you believe that that entire brand is built with a sound strategy using the sound of Tambo Dead as the signature voice of the brand? And subsequently, audio and radio collectively building that brand simply by these uh, clever radio campaigns that they've been uh, running for a couple of decades or more. Radio commercials, generally speaking, are things that we try to avoid. Think about it. When you listen to radio, what does radio boast about? Commercial free hour coming up. Whoopee! No commercial interruptions. Well, that's not because we don't want to hear commercials. We like hearing commercials. They're relevant sometimes. They're, uh, they make us feel local. We hear familiar stuff. We hear opportunities. We are reminded of things. So they work. They serve their purpose. What we don't want to hear are crappy radio commercials. And there's lots of them. Listen to what Jerry Seinfeld has to say about advertising. I love advertising because I love lying. In advertising, everything is the way you wish it was. I don't care that it won't be like that when I actually get the product being advertised because in between seeing the commercial and owning the thing, I'm happy. Look, you're going to see some of these quotes uh, that uh, remind us the power of sound. Power of sound is at the epicenter of everything we do in and around radio as long as it's on any kind of an audio platform. But it's a power that we often abuse or underutilize. And that's why I want to spend the next few minutes uh, sharing with you some of my thoughts after 40 years in this uh, industry and share with you my quick eight to be great when developing uh, creative. My name is Yaman Koskin. I'm the CEO and founder of Yaman Air Creative. We serve roughly 600 markets across the country, uh, providing creative services for radio stations specializing in audio, audio branding, and uh, sonic execution, which is now, of course, uh, goes way beyond radio as people spend more money on audio consumption, and therefore advertisers spend a lot more money on audio branding. The first thing that happened to you and to me and to any normal human on earth was not sight, it wasn't smell, it wasn't touch, it was this. It was heartbeats. Heartbeats is the first thing that happens to a human being that triggers emotions. And when that's the first thing that engages us and, and, and awakens our emotions, imagine what happens to that sense as we grow older. It becomes more sensitive, it controls our thoughts. Um, you've heard of the movie director M. Night Shyamalan, who did Sixth Sense, and one of the subsequent movies he did after that. All he had to do was get rid of a bone cracking sound. And it changed the rating of that movie from R to PG. The way we consume audio, the way we make decisions based on how audio makes us feel is what's behind audio branding strategy. And when used effectively, just like that Tom Bodeb commercial you heard and other great pieces of audio we come across from time to time that makes us feel something, not learn something, feel something, that's the best use of audio branding. But... In Washington, D.C., in front of the White House, could you see a group of protesters like this? Because they're fed up with bad, crappy commercials that annoy them and make them want to change their radio stations quickly? No, this will never happen. But thank you very much. I know you're impressed with my Photoshop skills. But if they were to take the time, if the radio listeners took the time to express how they feel about radio commercials, this is probably what they would do. Again, our emotions are triggered not by eye, but by ear, as confirmed here by a marketing genius, Jack Trout. So on that note, allow me to share with you my personal eight to be great. Simple guideline, 
when you find yourself touching creative, especially audio creative, for radio commercial production, follow these eight rules or follow most of them. And I assure you, you'll be light years ahead of an average locally produced radio commercial. Number one, write like you talk. Don't use ad words, ad speak. Develop copy that sounds like you're talking to a buddy of yours at a local Starbucks about a great new product or service. Those are the radio commercials that resonate. Number two, don't, don't try to write for the client. Write for the listener. Because if the listener responds positively, then the client wins, you win, and everybody else does. Number three, write for the heart, not for the mind. People don't make buying decisions with their minds. They make them with their hearts. You fall in love with that hot, new, beautiful, gorgeous car. You already made the emotional connection. Now your mind comes in secondary and tries to justify, make sense out of it. Can I afford the monthly payments? Is this the right car to buy now? Maybe I should do it pre-owned, whatever. Number four, don't write about the features, write about the benefits. If you hear a radio commercial that tells you about what's under the hood and how powerful the engine is and you know anti-lock brakes, and about, who cares? Tell me what it does for me. What's in it for me, my family, my safety, my enjoyment. Benefits, not features. Turn the mirror on them, stop pitching, start inspiring. Uh, I don't really care what kind of state-of-the-art uh, equipment this gym has. I do care about how this gym treats me when I walk in and how do I feel when I walk out. Talk about the consumer and turn the mirror on them and exalt them. Love them, not love yourself. Don't pound on your chest and say you're the best you know, uh, workout joint in town with convenient locations everywhere. We don't care. Tell me what's in it for me. One objective, one message only, one set of instructions. Never put multiple messages in one 30 second commercial because then it's not a commercial. It's a poop show. Nobody heard anything. Commercial is over. I have no idea what they just sold because they were pushing their inventory. They were mentioning that their anniversary sale. They also wanted to ensure that they have a special this month in their service department. You see, I mean, if I ask you where's the closest restroom is because I'm, you know, it's time sensitive and they give me five different instructions to get there, you see where this can go. Bad. Number seven. Simple guideline to give breathing room to commercials. If you're going to time your copy and you're writing a 15, make sure it only times out to 10. You're writing a 30, time it out to 20. You're writing a 60, time it out to 50. Thus giving your production geniuses ample room to bring that spot to life and not have it you know, shoved with information and verbiage and noise again. Uh, goes over people's heads and it's not effective. And lastly, use characters, not announcers. Even if it's an announcer copy, find a voice that's different, that has an accent, sounds funny, an old lady with a nasally delivery. Whatever the case is, make it memorable. That's the A to B great when designing audio spots for radio or anywhere else, including podcasts where pre-recorded commercials are important. Here's your perfect storm of success. The right platform, the right schedule, the right creative. When these three components come together, advertisers win and media companies win because they both get the results that they're seeking. Okay? Here's another great quote. You think you can control what kind of product you're selling by sound strategy? Of course you can, as seen in this quote. Ironically, I'm going to Close our little get together, not with a radio commercial, but with a TV commercial, because it puts everything I just shared with you in perspective. I'm just going to play a little sound bite because I know you know this commercial. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfit. You know what I'm talking about, right? The infamous, iconic Apple TV commercial. How is it that that commercial shows everything in the world except the computer? Because Apple doesn't sell a computer. They sell a membership to a cult. Volvo doesn't sell cars. They sell safety. Nike doesn't sell sneakers. They sell achievement. Do you see where I'm going with this? 
So always find out what the advertiser is selling, really. Is it a mattress store? Not really. Dig deeper. Better night's sleep? Yeah, dig deeper. Uh, better night's sleep, healthier life. Dig deeper. What does that mean? Performing better at work, better marriage, better relationships because you're sleeping better thanks to Joe's mattress store. Always dig deep, go into the rabbit hole, get lost, find the core, and then bring it back up onto the surface and build a campaign around it. The power of Radio Creative is the chief component in ROI when it comes to radio advertising. The creative is the alpha and omega of a successful radio campaign. Again, my name is Yaman Kaskin, Chief uh, Creative Officer and CEO of Yaman Air Creative. I welcome your comments, your questions, your concerns, or anything really you want to talk about at Yaman, Y-A-M-A-N, at YamanAir.com, Y-A-M-A-N-A-I-R.com. Thank you so much for your time and go apply that sound strategy. Make somebody fall in love with audio today. See ya. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I am MJ, the East Coast Director of Commercial Production for Benstown Branding. And my partner is Darren. He's the West Coast Director of Commercial Production for Benstown Branding. We're so thrilled that you joined us today. We're here to talk about audio advertising. And I say audio because ads are played on more than just the radio these days. There's streaming audio services, podcasts, of course, traditional broadcast radio, rebroadcasting ads. Apps, the list goes on and on. People are listening to audio wherever they have a device, and those devices are usually in their pockets, in their cars, on their desks, wherever they are. Effective audio advertising isn't just writing a few seconds of copy about a product or service. It's more than just a client's location, the services they offer, and that they have a friendly, knowledgeable staff. An effective ad should absolutely cut through the noise and make an emotional impact on the listener. Because when we can connect to a client's product or service with an emotion, listeners will remember that product or service and it becomes top of mind for them. That's what we call the emotional selling point, And it is the quickest, sneakiest psychological shortcut to effectively brand your client. Right now, I'm going to share my screen and show you a script that does just that. I'll give you a few seconds to read over the script. The emotional selling point of this script is that aha moment when you've bagged the big one. You've gotten the job of your dreams. With this ad, we connect it to the listener through humor, but also by emphasizing that Manitow can give you that aha moment, that career that you've been hunting for. So there are several parts to what we do. The first part is obviously writing a compelling script, but then we also have to create compelling audio. So I'm going to turn it over to Darren now to show you the magic behind the words. He's an absolute wizard with a digital audio workstation. All right. Well, thanks, MJ. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are going to switch screens to where uh, I use Pro Tools. There's many different things that you can use to put these uh, to, together. Uh, for Benstown, we are uh, using Pro Tools pretty much everywhere. So this is the way it's going to look before we've done anything. We've got tracks up and things like that. So as we go, we've got our voiceover talent. That's once it goes from the script, then it goes to the voiceover over talent. And once we get that, then we start to create. So I'm going to bring in the voiceover one. If you read the script, it was a, a guy whispering and very quiet. If you can hear I'm hunting careers. So then we'll bring in voiceover two. And we'll get ready to put that in and then we'll start moving everything around. So if you see the script, you, then you, once you get the voiceovers in. Very quiet. I'm hunting careers. <gasps> there's one. Well, there's your voiceover too. So you've got to put them in a setting, which if they're hunting, I'm going to assume that they're outside. So the per best way to tell people that somebody is outside, birds, always a good way. So I'm going to bring in sound effects of birds. And you should be able to hear the birds. Be very quiet. 
So that puts them outside. I figure they're hunting. And so you kind of want to, you've got to paint the picture, that theater of the mind, once you're producing a, a radio commercial, because they can't see it. So you've got to put it in their head. So as I'm thinking they're going to be walking, they're outside, they're out in a forest or a field somewhere because they're hunters. And so we'll put in people walking on grass. So we've got sound effects for that, which you can hear that here. Be very quiet. I'm hunting. And I figured there's two guys, so I'll make it a little bigger because there's two guys actually walking on grass. So we'll put a different sound effects of grass to make it sound like there's more than just one person. So once you play that back, you've kind of got the setting. Be very quiet. I'm hunting careers. <gasps> there's one! Now, once uh, Steve is who this character is, yells it, then you've got to have the birds flying away that he scared the birds. So now you're going to bring in the birds flying away. Here we go. So here's the... So there's the birds flying away. They're scared from Steve. And you've got pretty much your spot. There's one! Not a big hunter, are you, Steve? Sorry. And so once Steve does the punchline in at the end, that's where the announcer comes in and gives the actual commercial of what this is all, all about. You get uh, the creative stuff out of the way. So we bring in the announcer. Hunting for a new career. And you want to run a music bed underneath the announcer. So you bring in your music bed, which is going to start right after Steve says the punchline of you that he's sorry. Then you put in the announcer. And your spot sounds something like this. Be very quiet. I'm hunting careers. <gasps> There's one! Not a big hunter, are you, Steve? Sorry. Hunting for a new career? Look no further, because Manitou has their sights set on you. Come scope us out and see what Manitou can bring to your table. Great wages, great benefits, great company. Complete an application at HireClick.com or stop by their facility at 900 Furtick Street, Yankton, South Dakota. Join Team Manitou. So that's how you make a radio commercial in under three minutes, but there you go. Uh, my name is Darren Silva. I am the West Coast Director of Commercial Production. And I am Mary Jane Block, the East Coast Director of Commercial Production for Benstown. Thank you for watching the second module of the LABF Power Session. You can find contact information for the presenters and more details about LABF and links to support our activities in this video's description. Make sure to watch Module 3, where you'll learn about podcasting, imaging, composing, and owning a station. See you next time.